Okay? Um, so I'll continue with these different types of prior um, and the kind of the reminding you that now the the prior is our epistemic information, what we know about some parameter beforehand, what we know about the ratio of uh, girl and boy babies, what we know about probability that someone dies with or uh, without treatment. Um, and then in kind of the, the, in the history of uh, statistics and probability theory, um, so Laplace uh, kind of the, was fine with the, the prior information and what he wrote about priors is quite similar to what kind of the, in the modern day Bayesians would write. But at some point it was that the, um, uh, there was kind of the many people saying that no, we should not use any prior information that we can use only likelihood and we have to just let the data speak and Bayesians then some of them started to also then think that uh, in order to get acceptance Bayesians should also then have non-informative priors so that they trust the data but it's it's very difficult to be complete, completely uh, non-informative uh, like the flat in case of this binomial model and theta um, the flat uniform one is not that bad usually but um, if you think that instead of that what is your prior information about how much money I have in my wallet so it has to be positive so only now cash used uh, if you would now put the uniform prior that you say that you don't know anything how much money I might have in my wallet the uniform would go forever to infinity uh, it's quite unlikely that I have infinite amount of money it's quite un unlikely that I would have a billion or a million or even thousand euros I would guess that uh, if I would start asking you all, um, not many would say over a thousand. Someone might say a thousand just because maybe I, I just thought about that. It's a funny thing that if I have a thousand in my wallet. No, I have uh, probably less than two Danish crowns there. I'm flying to Copenhagen after the lecture. Um, so much more sensible prior would be for amount of cash would be then something which goes down. Yes, it could have a tail, some positive probability for quite a long time. Uh, maybe go into quite small value anyway, around 100 euro. It's more and more common that people can use pay everything with the card or mobile phone so I would also guess that every year uh, this prior probability how much cash there is in my wallet will go down so flat can't be stupid um, and then making prior flat somewhere can make it non-flat somewhere else so it's difficult to be completely non-informative um, and it's we come to weekly informative priors it's better to actually use use this information what, what we have available uh, some of these non-informative priors 
like the uniform prior, if it's um, open interval or the, the, the kind of the, this is from inf minus infinity to infinity or even from zero to infinity, actually it's improper. Integral over the uniform uh, is infinite and there's a term proper prior if it integrates to one. It's better to use proper priors. Even if sometimes improper priors can produce proper posterior, it, it's better to use proper priors. Um, in the book, this weekly informative priors, it's quite brief section and it was about the time when this was written that it was kind of evolving the ideas and nowadays we are um, emphasizing more about the informative part. The weekly one can refer to that, that uh, we can make some, if we have some background knowledge and we change it to mathematical form, we can make bit weaker it by just making it bit wider and then uh, kind of taking the account that we don't necessarily know how this background information, how well it actually holds in this specific case we are now analyzing. And if we learn something from there, let's make it a bit weaker. This is kind of what, what was in the book. But then if you go to this uh, prior choice wiki, you will see that there are much more different ideas now how to have at least some information more there. How much money I have in a wallet? You would have at least some idea what is the budget of Finland. So I probably have less money than that. Uh, if, it's, if it has to be cash, uh, you can see that what's the size of the wallet, it will give some limits and so on. So you could have some uh, up limits and if you are not certain about those, you can then always make them smooth and give some small probability with the, for the larger values. I already mentioned that we can do these weekly informative priors by starting with some um, more informative prior and then making it weaker. Or other way around, we can start with some quite weak and then add more information. And there's the link prior choice wiki. Um, example of informative prior already uh, talked about this percent of curl perch that it's stable. And it's actually that stable that it's really varying by more than 0.5 percentage from this rate. One of the most extreme case is um, in case of extreme uh, hunger, uh, long duration hunger, which have been observed uh, at the concentration camps during the Second World War. And even then, it's just around 0.5 percentage. So, um, Often you can start with the prior, which is around there. Um, there was a study on the percent of curl birds among parents in attra attractiveness categories one to five, assessed by interviewers in a face-to-face -face survey. And now comparing the whether attractiveness would be kind of extreme predictor compared to like the extreme hunger. Um, here's the data. Um, so divided in five categories, and it happens now that the fifth category has more curl babies. The sixth, the, the fifth category, the most attractive ones have something like 57 percentage of curl babies even if the prior information says that it's unlikely that it would be more than 
49.3. It's possible to make least squares regression line and come up with the result that uh, um, more attractive parents have more girl babies. And this was widely uh, published in newspapers. If we look at this in from the uh, using base inference, uh, the same dots on the right hand side in the upper row we have different lines which could go through those points and there are small lines which are kind of the more likely so they are posterior draws. We come back later how, how to uh, do these kind of posterior simulations that instead of computing the posterior density and plotting the posterior densities we can also visualize these and we can do these computations having more uh, for example these line fittings there which are more likely and with the uniform prior you can see that the line could be anywhere and with informative prior what we know beforehand we can see that the posterior is also about flat so this study had so few parents and babies that it wasn't uh, changing our information about the ratios considering all, all, all we knew beforehand about the, the these ratios and how stable it is Another example, um, this, is, this has also a model which is the, this kind of the um, linear fit, uh, models, um, regression models. Um, this is from our paper, Visualization in Bayesian Workflow. Um, that's interested to estimate the human exp exposure to air pollution from particulate matter measuring less than 2.5 microns in diameter. It's known that this is small enough uh, particles that they go to lungs and then in lungs they uh, affect the health. And it's been seen that in regions where there are more of this pollution, uh, people die younger. And like the recent report was estimated that overall this pollution responsible for 3 million deaths worldwide each year. So that's a lot. Um, there's measurements. So in this map, uh, you can see black uh, crosses, which are ground uh, monitor locations. You can see that uh, mostly in Europe, US, China, India, bits elsewhere. Uh, you get no, no information from Russia. Uh, not much information from Africa and so on. Um, the color coding in MAP is satellite estimate. So it's possible to um, use optical diffraction estimate to estimate the amount of these particles. And then we would like to calibrate these satellite measurements. Uh, how well this optical diffraction is actually, how good measurement is to measuring this compared to these ground monitors. Um, so here we have plotted then at locations of ground monitors. We have the log satellite measurement and log of uh, ground monitor PM 2.5 measurement. Different colors are from different regions and then we have a linear fits with some uncertainties and you can see that it might be that in different regions we should use different um, linear model and in addition if we think that we would add more and more different kind of things maybe we should have some prior information about um, for example, the how big the slope can be. So it's 
I mentioned earlier that we have this prior predictive distribution, so we can also think that what do we know beforehand um, about the distribution of some, or how densely we might have these particles in air? If we think about that and think about prior predictive distribution, and then we want to compute from that backwards, what would be reasonable priors for these linear model parameters? If we use the usual weak uh, information, so this is prior predictive distribution for log density of PM 2.5. Um, so we, have, we are uncertain, but let's add some information. What are these actual numbers going from minus 1,500 to 1,000? The rightmost dashed dot line is density of neutron star. Uh, the middle dashed line is density of concrete. And the right, leftmost hand uh, dotted line is uh, density of PM 2.5 at Pallas Tunturifels, which is one of the cleanest places uh, in Earth. So we can see that our priors, default, really wide priors, are not sensible. Um, we have some prior information. The density should definitely be less than a neutron star or less than density of concrete. And from kind of considering the sensible range, we can then come up with priors on these linear model parameters. At least now we are well below concrete. We still have some reasonable probability mass for observing outside something like clean room uh, air quality, but th this is already better. And we don't need to specifically get it exactly fit. At, at least we should get, when we talk about weekly informative prior, it should be at least somehow more reasonable than just uh, anything or very, very wide priors. Um, this often uh, then again these kind of the frequently asked questions about base uh, inference that what if we have incorrect prior? Um, priors usually have some effect anyway. We want to have that. In some way we can say that they introduce bias but they often also reduce the uncertainty that much that they, there's so much uh, reduction in variance that we get actually more efficient estimates, smaller estimation errors. And weekly informative priors should be su are usually such that they already reduce the variance a lot, but since they are weekly informative, they are not biasing much the results. I think there, there was supposed to be one extra slide, which is now missing. Just a moment. Okay, finally. So it was somehow just downloading the same slides again, again. again. So um, it's also now the the prior information, sometimes the discussion just stays in the prior for parameters. But it's important to also remember we have often structural prior information so that it affects not just parameters but also our model structure. And the example Um, time series modeling, useful predicting like 
uh, sales, customer flows, uh, server load, and so on. Um, this one I used Arstan downloads per day from RStudio CRAN Mirror. Um, it was easy to obtain, and um, I have some expert information about this, so um, easier to discuss. Uh, and you can see the black dots are the raw data. There's a blue line um, fitted to this data. And in the end, it's actually then predicting. So this was, I made this um, slide in beginning of 2019. And so the data ends there, and then there's a bit of prediction. We can zoom to that end part there. Um, so you can see this blue dark line, and then there's a blue uh, light, light blue region about the uncertainty. Uh, so we have also then, when making predictions, we have some uncertainty estimate about the um, future downloads. You can see structure here. There's uh, clearly this jump pink structure, and if you look, uh, you, can, you could recognize that it's weekly pattern. So there's less downloads during the weekend. Um, there's some overall uh, slowly changing trend, and then there are some big spikes. And now, when making this prediction, it was useful that I could use this structural information and divide this uh, in different parts. And you can see, so this is uh, Profit by Facebook, which is built on top of Stan. Um, Facebook uses this a lot in different parts of Facebook to make different kind of time series analysis and prediction and uh, possibilities like what was the effect on some intervention or advertisements and so on. Um, so you see increasing trend. Uh, you see the weekly pattern I mentioned. You see day of year effect where you can see that there's less downloads during the summer and we see these academic seasons that there's more uh, downloads when the teaching starts and when the second period starts. But there's also uh, the second row, it says holidays, but it's actually release dates, which are kind of holidays uh, for stand developers. Um, but this is the kind of the special, this, that we could include these different prior information, on what we know. We did not need to learn from data that there's a seven day week system, uh, there's a year, um, calendar system, and it would be really difficult to predict in the future when the next release dates are based on these. So if we want to make predictions, it's much easier if we can also include this prior information when there are release dates. So it's not just information about uh, in which range some parameter values are, but other other information, what we know about the uh, phenomenon. Uh, this is kind of the, just one slide about this. Um, it comes sometimes in these things, also when talking about um, conjugate priors, when talking about these um, simple exponential family models where we have the analytical solutions in chapter two and three. Uh, and so the sufficient statistic, uh, it's a quantity that it's some kind of um, smaller dimensional summary of the data, which is sufficient to provide the same information as the full data. In the binomial example, the actual data we observe is the sequence um, 
of red and yellow chips or survival and death, but it was sufficient if we are interested in theta to summarize it only with how many reds and how many yellows or how many reds and how many draws altogether. And then same way for the Gaussian uh, models, it is sufficient to have this mean and um, sum of um, square terms. Um, in this week assignment, you have given data and you make this binomial model and get the beta posterior and there are then these demos uh, for R and Python which show how to make these kind of plots. Um, it's also showing this simulation. We'll later in the course use a lot of these simulations uh, so that um, we randomly generate theta values so that we get more theta values where the density is high and then we can, if we then for those uh, simulations, if we make a histogram, these histograms look like this um, estimate for these posterior distributions. The reason why these, these simulations are so useful is that, uh, for example, in the binomial model, the theta was this proportion between 0 and 1, but sometimes we might be interested in then, uh, instead of that, writing a ratio so that um, what if we have theta divided by 1 minus theta and we could have it as a phi. Now it would be, even if we would have a, a in a binomial model, if we would have analytic solution for the posterior distribution of theta, it's difficult then to compute this kind of further ratios. But if we get a draw, so we have a distribution for theta and we can randomly generate simulations from this and if we then compute for each simulation phi we get then simulations from the phi axis and so you can see how to compute these kind of um, summaries um, and transformations uh, of variables. Um, also then there was this that we could have analytic posterior distribution for binomial model if we use the conjugate beta prior and this then this demo illustrates you that we don't need to have conjugate priors. The simplest approach then to compute something so that uh, the first one is posterior with uniform prior or it could be then the likelihood and we could combine it with some non-conjugate prior. So anything you think that is describing your prior information. In this case, this non-conjugate priority, the uh, peak is centered on the known uh, ratio of um, girls and boys, and then we just made something that goes down, uh, and then small uh, density uh, for the um, smaller and larger values. Um, 
when we plot these, these kind of densities, also in com computers, we are not plotting actually them continuously in infinite many points. For computer also, when we compute the likelihood, we compute it in very, very small intervals. We give some theta value and ask what is the density. And then we just compute it in many, 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 many points, connect the points, and then it looks like it's continuous. We can then, at a similar way, we can form this non conjugate prior so that we compute the value for it many, many points. And then again, when we have the prior like this, at each of these locations, we can take the likelihood value and the prior value and multiply them. And then we get in many, many points, we get this likelihood times prior values. And you can see the, how it is computed there. It's useful to understand this concept that we can evaluate these densities in any finite number of points, because when we go to this, more how these different sampling algorithms works. Uh, it is important to kind of understand that we often don't actually see the whole density evaluated in many, many points. We have only limited number of capacity. We are only limited that we want to evaluate this only maybe in 10 different locations, 100 or 1,000 different locations. Um, there's a demo illustrating inverse CDF methods. Again, when we had this evaluated now in many, many points, this non-conjugate uh, posterior distribution, we can also then, instead of just looking at these densities, we can compute the cumulative density function, which is just we make a cumulative sum. So the first value, then the next one we plot there the sum of two first values, then we plot the sum of three first values, and so on. And then we get many, many points which form then the cumulative density function. And then this cumulative density function has then the property that it starts from zero and it goes up to one. And this inverse CDF approach draws a random number between zero and one, finds what's the corresponding location in CDF, and mirrors the draw there, and repeatingly. I will show, show this uh, animation um, soon. And then your assignment is then this Algae Statutes, um, Finnish Lakes, and Easy Binomial um, Model, and you experiment also then how prior information affects your result, and then go these um, basic inferences. Um, Uh, so in case of a binomial model, we had um, this discrete observation, how many uh, reds or deaths uh, or girls. Um, the normal distribution or Gaussian distribution is the simplest one then for continuous um, observations and so that we have this kind of bell-shaped curve 
uh, with some so mean and variance or standard deviation. So variance is squared uh, of the standard deviation. And then in the chapter two, it introduces now either with um, assuming variance is known or mean is known and looking it only at the as a, uh, one parameter model. And it's useful to read these parts also uh, for the next week when there's more about then the um, both unknown. But you don't have exercise of these because these are not that useful compared to uh, when we have both unknown. Um, and then there's the form of the density uh, where you can see there's the y, the observation, so now just one observation first, minus theta, the squared difference uh, scaled by this, uh, divided by two times uh, the variance and exponentiated, which makes then this um, bell shape and normalization term. Um, it's often justified based on central limit theorem, which says that if we have uh, random numbers which have a finite variance, and if we have many of them, then some of them or average of them has normal distribution or gets closer and closer to normal distribution. Um, it's partially true. We have a lot of things that um, are actually part of many, many compo components which have a finite variance and none of the components dominate strongly. Um, for example, height of people uh, separately for male and female is quite close to Gaussian. Uh, we know there are many genes which affect also height. Each of these genes you can have um, inherited then zero, one, or two alleles of specific type. So for each gene there's only three choices. But when we sum effects of many, many genes, and they've already in studies found uh, at least several hundreds, uh, if not already thousands of genes which affect height, and when you sum many of those effects uh, and then combine also with the environmental effects, then variability in uh, human heights is close to cost. More often, the, this normal distribution Gaussian is used for computational convenience or just because others used it. Um, so it is useful to learn it, but it's also useful to understand that you should not just kind of the, uh, the central limit theorem is actually a bit weak and you should always check whether the normal distribution is actually useful for you. Um, normal distribution is also part of exponential family, so it has conjugate prior for theta, and then uh, in this case, um, when I take from the distribution equation those parts which depend on theta, so we assume now sigma unknown we get the likelihood and then we can recognize that the prior has to be kind of similar and then the prior is actually also normal and knowing this uh, um, how to compute with exponent, exponents uh, exponential function we can combine them and these are kind of the part of the also Comp uh, these calculation tricks, so there are some of the exercises now listed, so exercises listed in the book, and then the, some of these are mentioned 
in the course GitHub page recommended that if you want to understand normal distribution better, best way is to do some of these pen and paper calculations. You don't get now extra points for them, but this has been also uh, something some students have asked that could you point out some uh, easy tasks, uh, which have also model solutions. And then there's, so there's this exercise 2.14 I specifically recommend uh, where you learn more about the normal distribution. Um, example, here the x could be, for example, heights that you would see two different persons and you would guess how um, tall they are and you would have some uncertainty. For one, you have less uncertainty, and for the another one, you have more uncertainty. And then you would have a prior based on population prior for males. And you can see when we combine now prior and observation, it also affects that uh, if the observation was um, narrow, the kind of the precise observation, prior affects less, and if the observation was less precise, prior affects more. Um, we can combine several observations. So we had a conjugate prior was normal, uh, posterior is normal, we can use that as a prior for the next one, and then chain rule gives us what if we have many observations. And this is again one of the exercises you can uh, go through that, yes, this is what happens. Posture predictive distribution. So if we know theta, so if we know the location parameter, uh, we have a normal distribution, but if we don't know and posterior for that is normal, we have two normals, and when we integrate over that, we get again a normal which has variance terms. One, which is this aleatoric, what was the original sigma, and then the epistemic one, because we don't know what is the location uh, tau one, which was then computed before. I don't explain this more. You can, uh, it's much easier for you then to look at the book and then go with pen and paper, some of these. And it's also, because in assignments you are doing anyway, then this inference computationally. So if you don't want to then do these pen and paper exercises, you can skip these. So I just kind of uh, advertise this for those who want to uh, go deeper in the equations. 